Hi, my name is Lizzie Chan, and I'm a member of the CPA Institute's Young Leaders and Alternative Dispute Resolution Steering Committee. I am delighted to host today's episode of the CPR YADR Corporate Council Interview Series. The YADR seeks to educate the next generation of leaders on the full spectrum of dispute resolution and prevention mechanisms, and to provide insights into how CPR's community of in-house counsel, external counsel, and other experts in the ADR field are using dispute resolution and prevention mechanisms to manage conflict to enable purpose. As part of this goal and this interview series, I'm interviewing corporate counsel from companies around the world about their experience with ADR, as well as their, as well as their advice for young practitioners. Today, I am delighted to welcome Leanne Gale, who is the Executive Vice President and General Counsel, Corporate Governance and Compliance of Nestle, based in Switzerland. Welcome, Leanne. Hello, Lizzie. Thank you very much for having me uh, participate in this series with you. Really happy to be here. We are delighted to have you. And my first question for you today is, can you tell us a little bit about your career experience and your role now at Nestle. Yes, uh, very happy to do that. Uh, so I've been a practicing lawyer for uh, 30 years. It's gone by very fast. And uh, unlike many, my entire career, other than when I articled, has been as in-house counsel. Uh, so I worked in the manufacturing area. I worked in banking, uh, oil and gas, energy industry and now here at Nestle. And in multiple types of roles, both operational, both management, uh, ethics and compliance. And I've loved every single role uh, for the most part. Uh, I feel very fortunate and blessed to have had all of those opportunities. And I think working in-house is, is, is fantastic, which is why I'm still in-house. I am so delighted to hear that. Now I want to ask you a question about your ADR experience. So what are some best practices that you can share for cooperating with your business partners so as to avoid disputes or to resolve them early? Yes, so I think a key, a key um, factor in successful relationships with third parties is to uh, understand what are the ultimate goals of both parties and see whether or not you can align on those. Uh, a big part of that then is understanding what drives the other party uh, and what are their, their objectives and, and is there any alignment uh, on those uh, objectives. Um, I think a lot of times uh, we fail to look at the other party's perspective and think about how can we align on principles uh, and, and purpose to make the relationship as successful as possible. Now, in many cases, it's, it's a transactional deal, uh, you know, a supply agreement that might not be very big or um, just a, a, a usual business transaction. So you don't have that opportunity, uh, but on the bigger deals, uh, I think that's a key success factor, especially if they're um, an ongoing relationship in terms of a joint venture or providing services and goods, that's longer term. And the more we can align on our mutually beneficial objectives and how we're gonna get there, uh, the better I believe uh, the relationship will be to enable you to solve conflicts when they do arise. Your point about aligning mutually beneficial objectives is so important. And this is something, you know, we're really thinking about an ADR. So, you know, there's a big focus um, on international arbitration, for example, but I know that, you know, the CPI is working very hard on encouraging users to learn more about mediation and settlement and other forms of ADI that will help parties to resolve their disputes by aligning their objectives, as you say. So just pivoting slightly, I read a very interesting article in the GC magazine about the role of general counsel in championing uh, gender diversity in their workplaces. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your views on gender diversity in the workplace. 
Yes, very, very happy to do that. It is a, a subject of which I'm, I'm quite passionate about and not restricted to gender diversity. Uh, I believe diversity in all its forms is a critical enabler to really performing one's best, uh, both uh, as an individual, but also as a company. And, and what do I mean by that? The more perspectives we can bring to a a, an issue, a problem, a project, in my view, the better the outcome, because you've had the opportunity to look at it from different angles, different perspectives, incorporate the learnings of each person's experience. So as an individual, how does that benefit me? Well, if you know how to do something that I don't know how to do, well, it would be great if I could learn from you to help me learn. It would also be great if someone else also has experience, I can learn from them too. Likewise, if I'm able to share something with you, you benefit from that. So that, that diverse thinking, even to enable our own individual performance can be very beneficial. On a bigger scale as a corporation uh, like Nestle and previous employers, the more minds and thoughts and experiences and perspectives that can be put on a problem or a project, the more robust it will stand up to future challenges, future scrutiny, uh, future issues, because that thought process has really been taken into account and incorporated in that final work product. And the only way to get that diversity is to create an inclusive environment. And if we come back to gender, uh, gender diversity, you know, again, um, that different perspective based on experiences uh, that we can bring to the table uh, is ultimately beneficial for the bottom line, as I think we've seen quite a few studies now uh, showing that, uh, that gender diverse boards of directors, management teams, et cetera, actually perform better on the bottom line uh, overall at the end of the day. There are so many important imperatives for getting that diversity of perspectives and I know that you know, companies like yours are leading the charge on this. Actually, there was um, an ECHA task force report on international arbitration issued last year saying that you know, users of arbitration can play a really important role in promoting gender diversity in our field through their requirements of external counsel. So I was wondering uh, from a gender pers uh, diversity perspective or, um, or all forms of uh, diversity, what are your expectations when you hire external counsel? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. It's a very important one because I believe that uh, as in-house counsel, we have a strong role to play in promoting diversity and inclusion, uh, as do uh, uh, external law firms, as do law, so law societies and uh, uh, law schools as well. So we are a signatory to the general counsel statement for uh, diversity and inclusion that's been adopted uh, here in Europe. Uh, and it uh, sets out a number of, of statements and milestones and actions that we will take, including working with external counsel and ensuring diverse teams. So we want to look at uh, what are the programs, uh, the initiatives, um, the philosophy within the firms we work with to promote gender diversity, but also diversity on a broader basis. So we would expect to see teams that are made up of diverse uh, perspectives, and, and, but also in an inclusive environment. Uh, it, it, it doesn't help to bring uh, a, a diverse team if no one's allowed to speak except for the senior partner. So it, it's not only that diversity in terms of people you're bringing to the table, but then the inclusiveness in making sure all voices are heard. I wanted to pick up on your comment about the freedom to speak. I read your interview in the GC magazine and you talked about the importance of having an open culture where people feel or feel free to speak up. I was, could you explain why you think that's important and how do you create that culture? Yeah, yes, it's, it's you know, directly related to my views on diversity and inclusion. Unless, unless you create an environment where people feel free to speak their views, their mind, without fear of negative consequences, we will miss their best thoughts 
their best ideas. Um, we will miss the innovative thinking that might not, uh, the person might not feel comfortable bringing forward because they think, oh, well, it'll be, you know, they'll be ridiculed or, or, be, or be shushed or not respected. If, if we want the best of everyone and respecting no matter where they come from, no matter what, you know, religion, uh, sexual orientation, race, color, et cetera, we need to create an environment where all of the views are respected and welcomed and to even go further, encouraged. And it's really important to create that environment and for each of us, but particularly leaders, to demonstrate that welcome and, and, and um, uh, asking for different opinions. So anyone can be a leader in this sense. You know, if you're in a conversation and you haven't heard from someone, you can intervene and say, oh, I haven't heard from Lizzie yet. Lizzie, what's your, what's your thoughts on this project? You can do that as an individual. You don't have to be the most senior person. You don't have to be the leader, but I think it's incumbent upon leaders to make sure they do that and thank people for their ideas, their interventions, for speaking up with a different perspective or even challenging. That is creating a, a, an environment where people feel free to speak up, where people's views are valued. It doesn't mean you take them all the time and it doesn't mean that, um, that uh, you're not, uh, the, the, the consensus or whatever path you're going on isn't the correct one, but everyone then benefits from that diverse perspective. And, and you only get that if you create the environment. The other reason I feel really strongly about this is because it, undermine, it underlines so many other behaviors that really enable it, an organization to, to be firing on all cylinders. You know, it helps from a, a cultural integrity perspective, you know, feeling free to speak up when you see something that might not be right. It helps from a health and safety perspective, you know, intervening when you see someone might be in danger or there might be a hazard that someone hasn't seen. And, and performance, you know, the essence of, of Lean and Six Sigma is asking people who actually do the work, what can be done better? Well, unless you ask them, and create an environment where they know their opinions will be valued, how are you ever going to improve? So the, the, that underlying behavior on creating that open environment where people feel free to speak up is so powerful from all of these dimensions. But to get there, you have to create that environment. Thank you so much for your inspiring message and you know, giving me the opportunity to speak with you on this platform, even though I know you are so busy. <clears throat> I wanted to pick up on an earlier comment you made about aligning objectives, which requires you know, understanding your client. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how external counsel can better understand the client's priorities and objectives. And this is especially for junior and mid-level uh, practitioners who might feel afraid of, uh, to approach the client. Yes, no, thank you for the question. I think it's a great question too. Uh, there are a couple of things that, that one can do. Uh, first, from an external counsel perspective, if, if you haven't had a chance to have a, a session with your clients on what their strategies and objectives are, what their challenges are, that's something you should ask for. Um, you know, in my different roles that I've had, uh, you know, I've organized uh, strategy days with external counsel to share with them what our objectives are so that we can align and, and not have to redo and, and make up time when we're instructing on a particular matter. They already have the overall broader perspective on terms of strategy and challenges. So that I would certainly encourage everyone to do if, if they haven't done, done it already. And it's mutual. You know, what can, what what are we trying to achieve? How can you help us achieve that? What can we do better? How do you see things that we may not have thought of? I think that's one great area. Uh, a second uh, for more junior or mid-level associates, if you have an opportunity to do a secondment or even, it doesn't even have to be long, just go and work from a client's offices, I know it's a little different uh, these days with COVID, but you know, when, once we are able to return to more physical presence, to get a sense of how that operates internally. What are the 
unwritten rules, the structures, the considerations that are far broader when you're in an in-house in role than, than in an external role. So making it known to your more senior partners uh, uh, and uh, supervisors that this is something you'd be interested in uh, and, and that you'd like to do, I think is a great uh, step to make that awareness. And then asking the question, you know, if there's a regular client with whom uh, you, uh, your firm has been working with, um, asking if you can go along or attend a call or just, just to listen and learn. Uh, there is no harm to asking and the upside is they might say, yeah, come on along. It's, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of it before? So that you can learn. Now, of course, from a client perspective, I, I, you know, I wanna be mindful that I'm not being charged twice uh, for, for the learning experience, but I'm more than happy to have a more junior associates come along for their learning and development. And one other thing that um, uh, we've talked a bit about uh, internally on a few occasions, but we haven't yet made happen is, uh, should we try to do more swaps uh, between in-house, larger in-house counsel um, departments and, and law firms? You know, if we have roughly similar levels of uh, qualification, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of benefit that could be done from just a swap. Uh, depending on, on the, the industry and the area of practice, et cetera. Uh, so those are, those are a few ideas in terms of how, how that could be increased uh, in terms of understanding what's happening with the client. Uh, and the other one, of course, is uh, you know, reading up on the strategies, the objectives, the challenges uh, through the annual reports. And nowadays, the sustainability uh, and ESG reports I think is another great way to, to try and get up to speed so that when you do have that opportunity to, to lean in and learn even more, you already have some, some basics uh, covered on that. Thank you so much for sharing those ideas, which I'll take away with me in my own role at work. And I really like the idea of a swap. But speaking of your advice for young practitioners and picking up on your earlier comment that you have spent most of your career in-house, what is your advice for young lawyers who, uh, who wish to pursue an in-house career? Yes, well, if you've already decided that that's what you'd like to do, then I would say the next thing is think about what type of company and what type of industry. There are a huge range of opportunities from, from small, you know, one person lawyer uh, companies to huge ones that have a thousand legal staff. And I've had the benefit of working in a very small one where we were three and four to you know, ones where we've had over a thousand. And they have different um, dynamics, uh, different challenges, uh, both still super interesting. Uh, so you know, think about what you'd like to experience. Uh, I would say that from my experience working in a smaller company, you get a lot more responsibility a lot faster and have to actually be really flexible because you never know what might come your way. Uh, the advantage in a larger, larger organization is you can become uh, more uh, experienced and specialized in certain areas and there's more opportunity to grow because it's a larger department, uh, obviously. Uh, but both have their, their, great, uh, their great attributes. Then in terms of industry, you know, myself, having worked in, in different industries, I realized that I really like working for companies where we make something, something tangible. I like that. Uh, I worked at a bank uh, for a while, a short while, and that didn't get me as excited in terms of our product as it has since working in a company that actually makes something. And that, that may sound a little weird, but think about what you're interested in and, and what type of um, uh, products or services or industries that you know you have a passion for uh, that you would really be excited to to work in that field or with that type of of, of company. And the last I would say is uh, don't be afraid to try a new area of law um, in in an in-house concept or, or, or uh, environment because you never know what you might like. Uh, and I have a personal experience with pensions, which I thought I would, would never like. And then I was, had an opportunity to do that as uh, my main task. And I, I fell in love with pensions. And you don't hear that often, 
uh, but I think I think they're a great area of law. Uh, so uh, different opportunities might present themselves in different clothing, and you know don't be afraid to uh, to to reach out and 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 learn a new area uh, as you're developing your in-house skills. Thank you for those very interesting and useful guiding factors. And I, I really enjoyed uh, your comment about, you know, liking companies that make things and are innovative. I think that's really cool. Mm. Um, I, so I just have one final question for you, which is what is your advice for young practitioners in the legal field? Oh, yes, uh, uh, that's a great question and, and one that I've had to think about on different occasions. I would say, first, whatever you do, do it to your best ability. Uh, it may not be the most glamorous task. Uh, in fact, it may be one you say, why did I go to law school for this? But people who are looking and supervising and, and might hear of you, will know that no matter what you're given, you do it to your best ability, which gives other people confidence that they can give you other things. So always do your best, no matter what the task, no matter how much you might like it or not. Uh, I think that's a key um, enabler to, to future success. Um, another one is don't be afraid to take on new challenges. Uh, I had, a, I had a, a boss and he used to say, he looks for the person who, when he holds out the ball, who grabs it and runs. So if you're given an opportunity to work on something new, something different, uh, grab it, explore it, make the best of it. You are going to learn no matter what it is. And again, that gives a lot of confidence to people who might want to uh, hire you, uh, might want to promote you, might want to put you on a project that's important and they want to make sure they can, can have confidence in the ability of the person to do it, even if they've never done it before. Uh, so so uh, that, that I think is another very important uh, part of it. And then the third thing that I would say is um, collaboration and respect for, for your entire team, no matter what the position. Uh, that I think is, is a key enabler as well. Um, and, and so I think focus on those three, those are the three I would, I would land on. I love all three of those ideas. And, you know, especially the one about doing your best and, and, this, and the second one about, you know, not being afraid to try new things. I think, you know, nowadays in the legal field, we often are so specialized. But something I've learned from my in-house counsel friends who have moved from arbitration in, into um, in-house counsel roles at, at companies, they've told me that you just learn, you know, they might not have done many transactions before, but they say you learn on the job. And I think it's really great to remember that, you know, the skills we learn in one context of law might be applicable in others. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Leanne, and for sharing with us your insights. And I'd like to thank our audience as well for tuning in. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Lovely to speak with you.